Well, today was a routine work day for America's 93,900 probation officers. But one of those probation officers had the least routine work day of that probation officer's life today when that probation officer in New York City became the first probation officer in history to interview a former president of the United States. Donald Trump's first probation interview today is a standard and necessary part of determining what sentence Donald Trump should receive after a Manhattan jury found him guilty of 34 felony charges of falsifying business records with the criminal intent of violating New York election law in the 2016 presidential election. The probation department will use Donald Trump's responses today to determine what sentence the probation department will recommend for defendant Trump at his sentencing hearing on July 11th. In yet another demonstration of Donald Trump getting extra favorable treatment while he is complaining of being persecuted, Judge Juan Mershon allowed Donald Trump's criminal defense lawyer to attend Donald Trump's first probation meeting. And the probation department allowed that meeting to take place virtually with Donald Trump in Florida. The special treatment for Donald Trump did not go unnoticed by the Legal Aid Society, the Bronx Defenders, New York County Defender Services, and Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem. They issued a joint statement saying, all people convicted of crimes should be allowed counsel in their probation interview, not just billionaires. This is just another example of the two-tiered system of justice. Pre-sentencing interviews with probation officers influence sentencing and public defenders are deprived of joining their clients for these meetings. The option of joining these interviews virtually is typically not extended to the people we represent either. To ensure integrity and fairness, we call on NYC Department of Probation to ensure that all New Yorkers, regardless of income, status, or class, receive the same pre-sentencing opportunities. NBC News is reporting that the interview lasted less than 30 minutes and that Donald Trump's probation officer is a woman. CNN is reporting that the commissioner for the New York City Department of Probation was present along with the general counsel for the department. Joining our discussion now is Martin Horn. He's the former commissioner of New York City's Department of Probation. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to get a sense of how unusual this was. We already have a sense that, that it was uh, a bit unusual. <clears throat> but as to the um, presence of counsel and it, it being remote, uh, you have these people representing uh, other defendants saying that is never available to us. That's correct. It's highly unusual. I think that uh, it's appropriate to make some accommodation and recognize the fact that uh, when Trump shows up, he's going to be accompanied by the Secret Service, he's going to be accompanied by uh, press, and his presence might be disruptive. So the idea of uh, doing the interview remotely doesn't trouble me that much. I think it's somewhat appropriate. Uh, and certainly during COVID, I think probation made use of these kinds of remote interviews uh, I think you can make arguments both ways. The presence of counsel is highly unusual, and the presence of the commissioner is something that I've never heard of in 40 years in this business. Can you think of a reason for doing it? If you were commissioner at the time, would you do it? Would you join that meeting? No. I cannot think of a reason to do it. I think it, it skews the interview. I, <laughs> I, I think too many people in the room uh, is uh, uh, distracting and disruptive and not conducive uh, to candor. And so, no, I definitely wouldn't have done it, and uh, I, I don't think it should have been done in this case. Uh, so 30 minutes is the report we're getting. Uh, what do you make of that? Sounds abbreviated to me. Usually uh, these things take at least an hour. Uh, the... Uh, content of what this interview was supposed to cover and what this report is supposed to address is spelled out very explicitly in state regulations. And it goes on at some length, and it covers a wide uh, uh, array of, uh, of issues. 
I don't believe they could be addressed in a half hour unless uh, Mr. Trump uh, just refused to discuss all of them, which was certainly his right to do. There is reporting that he did cooperate and answered uh, all the questions. Uh, not sure whether that's completely true, but uh, assuming that, uh, what do you think are the most important things that they should have obtained in this discussion? I think that the, the uh, judge certainly knows this defendant. He doesn't need to know much more. Uh, I think the important question uh, to be addressed here was uh, aggravating or mitigating circumstances. This was an opportunity for the defendant to set forth mitigating circumstances and for the probation officer uh, on behalf of the people to set forth any aggravating circumstances. But perhaps most importantly of all is the question of whether if this individual is not sent to prison, but is granted uh, probation, is this an individual who is likely to accept the terms of that probation and the supervision of a probation officer? And what would the terms of probation be, and what would that supervision be like? All I can speak to is the typical case, and obviously this is not the typical case, but typically a probationer would be expected to report to the probation office periodically, uh, certainly no less than monthly at first, uh, to uh, keep the probation officer apprised of his or her comings and goings, certainly not to engage in illegal activities, not to associate with individuals engaged in illegal activities, certainly not to uh, misuse uh, drugs and alcohol, uh, to uh, fulfill his or her financial obligations, uh, both uh, to uh, his or her defendant uh, dependents, but uh, also any fines or restitution uh, that has been ordered. What about associating with people who have been convicted of crimes? Uh, many people around Donald Trump have been convicted of crimes. Historically, uh, this has been uh, discouraged by probation agencies around the country. Uh, it's been liberalized somewhat recently. But I think it's something that the probation officer appropriately uh, would discuss uh, with the individual uh, to determine uh, whether it is uh, the association is occurring for a good reason or not. Martin Horn, thank you very much for joining us tonight and sharing your expertise. You're welcome. Thank you. And this evening in Florida, Donald Trump's favorite federal judge, who he appointed, Aileen Mercedes Cannon, denied Donald Trump's request to dismiss the federal criminal case against him for violations of the Espionage Act and illegal possession of classified documents. Judge Cannon wrote that the charges in Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's indictment of Donald Trump are, quote, either permitted by law, raise evidentiary challenges not appropriate for disposition at this juncture and or <clears throat> do not require dismissal, even if technically deficient, so long as the jury is instructed appropriately and presented with adequate verdict forms as to each defendant's alleged conduct. Judge Cannon did grant the Trump request to strike one paragraph of the indictment about Donald Trump's alleged meeting with a representative of his political action committee, believed to be his campaign advisor, Susie Wiles, at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey in 2021. The indictment says that Donald Trump showed that person a classified map at that time. Judge Cannon said that because showing that map is not one of the charged crimes in the indictment, it is, quote, not appropriate, her phrase, not appropriate to include it in the indictment. And in the ongoing scandal that is the United States Supreme Court, now there are tapes, thanks to Lauren Windsor, who was interviewed by Joy Reid earlier this evening. Lauren Windsor is a progressive activist who is known to approach important Republican people, pretending to be an ally, making flattering comments, and then secretly recording their responses. She is a dues-paying member of the Supreme Court Historical Society, which has corrupted itself into an organization that allows right-wing Supreme Court influencers to comfortably influence right-wing Supreme Court justices at the annual dinner of that organization. Last year, at the Supreme Court Historical Society's annual dinner, Lauren Windsor made recordings of her chats with Supreme Court justices 
that even she found so uninteresting, she did not publish them. This year was different. She got Samuel Alito to agree on tape to the goal of returning the country to, quote, a place of godliness. As a Catholic and as someone who, like, really cherishes my faith, I just don't, I don't know that we can negotiate with the left in the way that, like, needs to happen for the polarization to end. I think that it's a matter of, like, winning. I think you're probably right. I mean, one side or the other, one side or the other is going to win. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there can be a, 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 a way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really can't be compromised. You know, really can't be compromised. So it's not like we're going to split the difference. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just, I think that the solution really is like winning the moral argument. Like people in this country who believe in God have got to keep fighting for that to return our country to a place of, of godliness. Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. And by contrast, Chief Justice Roberts responded very differently. But you don't think there's like a a role for the court in, like, guiding us toward a more moral path? No, I think the role for the court is deciding the cases. If I start, would you want me to be in charge of guiding us toward a more moral path? That's for the people we elect. That's not for lawyers. Well, I guess I just, I believe that the founders who are godly, like, we're, we're, we're Christians. And right. I think that we live in a Christian nation and that our Supreme Court should be guiding us true. in that path. Yeah, I don't know that we live in a Christian nation. I know a lot of Jewish and Muslim friends who would say, maybe not. Uh, and it's not our job to do that. It's our job to decide the, the cases as best we can. And since Samuel Alito made his wife very much a public figure by blaming her publicly for flying flags supportive of the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol at their homes, you might expect Mrs. Alito to have little to say to strangers about flags. And you would be wrong. But why do you think they're coming after you? They're, they are. I mean, like, the, the, the whole, like, appeal to have heaven flag was, like, bull****, right? Right, right, but that's, you know, the, the other thing is the fem Nazis believe that he should control me. Feminazi is a term coined by Rush Limbaugh, who died three years ago. Rush Limbaugh coined the term in the early 1990s, when he was not just the center of right-wing media, he was the only real national right-wing media. Fox News had not even been invented yet. And so Samuel Alito's wife is quoting material from Rush Limbaugh that is over 30 years old. That's how long she's apparently been listening and taking direction from the likes of Rush Limbaugh. You know what I want? I want a sacred heart of Jesus flag because I have to look across the lagoon at the pride flag for the next month. Exactly. And, and he's like, oh, please don't put up a flag. I said, I won't do it because I'm deferring to you. But when you are free of this nonsense, I'm putting it up and I'm going to send them a message every day. Maybe every week I'll be changing the flags. There'll be all kinds. I made a flag in my head. This is how I, I satisfy myself. I made a flag. It's white and it's yellow and orange flames around it. And in in the middle is the word vergogna. Vergogna in Italian means shame. Shame indeed. Joining us now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York. He's an MSNBC legal analyst and co-author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Trump Indictments. Uh, Andrew, this is uh, quite an interesting uh, window of sound uh, into the thinking of Samuel Alito and uh, Chief Justice Roberts. Well, the description from both of them couldn't be more striking uh, in terms of where the country is. And, you know, we are hearing from a man who is a principal architect for the reversal 
after 50 years of Roe versus Wade, um, his thinking is, you know, in that decision is, I think, just as weak as his thinking that was shown in the letter he submitted trying to justify the flag incident. Um, and you also have this dichotomy because you have the chief justice saying what is, of course, the correct thing to say. Um, and we're, you know, we're on the eve of about of getting a decision on presidential immunity, and it is. It is a real um, sort of blot on this country and the judicial system. Uh, I hate to be so direct that you have Justice Alito and Justice Thomas sitting on those um, decisions. Um, that is not the way the country is supposed to be operated. It's not the way the court is supposed to be operating. And their conduct, um, as reflected on these tapes, but their conduct in many ways, even without these tapes, is something that is really besmirching, you know, the, the really important branch of government um, in this country that we are entitled to count on. And it's very hard to have faith in the system when you have that kind of conduct and these kinds of tape recordings coming out. And uh, we also have in, in these tapes now, uh, something very close to proving that Samuel Alito, Supreme Court Justice, lied, lied publicly about the flags and the reason for the flags being up, uh, because here's uh, the person who he's blaming on the flags being up, saying uh, she wants to do these flags just because of the flags that other people have, including the pride, pride, <clears throat> pride flag, uh, that somehow is oppressive to her. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing in there about I did it just in response. And we know that even that story, the timing of that story didn't make any sense uh, in terms of um, when what it was supposed to be in response to, um, as we have now heard um, from, with respect to the police report and the neighbor uh, across the way. Um, and so. What's really just amazing to me is that there is just zero accountability um, of the Supreme Court. And that is where Chief Justice Roberts, as much as he, um, you know, may be a good man personally, and he obviously said the right things, which, you know, you don't really get credit for that, for saying the right things, because that's what's expected. Um, but that's where he is um, to blame in part for not taking stronger action. And there are a number of things he can do um, that would put more pressure on um, two justices who are really not upholding their oaths of office in a way that helps this country writ large, whatever side you're on. Um, if you saw this from you know a so-called liberal justice, I think we would be just as outraged. And of course, in the what aboutism, you know, you would hear just as much, but rightly from the the far right that that is not appropriate behavior. You know, Andrew, I think uh, I'll, speak, I'll speak for me, and I think this applies to you. I spent most of my life uh, finding it inconceivable that we'd be doing a story about a Supreme Court justice lying. And lying about something important and public that affects the uh, integrity of the court's own decisions, and uh, and I'm now realizing in retrospect that the reason that was inconceivable was really the Supreme Court justices themselves, uh, who we grew up with, who couldn't possibly uh, step in these things the way Samuel Alito has, uh, the way Clarence Thomas has. But especially Alito, with the with the flags and and his wife making these comments to a stranger uh, about the flags uh, that have become something far beyond controversial. The, the, these the the flags that they're flying that are the the, the that share the spirit of the January sixth insurrection, all of that just completely inconceivable, not because of any ethics enforcement body, but simply because. Who was actually serving on the Supreme Court, whether we agreed with them or not, uh, during most of our lifetimes? Well, I just want to point out one other aspect of what he was heard now on tape saying, which is that this is a Christian nation and mm -hmm. should be brought to more to be a Christian nation. And, you know, as a Jewish American, 
that is not how, what is our country is about. I mean, there is an establishment uh, clause that is supposed to separate um, the uh, those are religious um, beliefs, which everyone's entitled to their own, but it is not established um, by the government. Um, and that principle is very much under attack right now um, with at least five, if not six justices. But here, he hearing that from Justice Alito's mouth basically just rips off any sort of pretense as to what's going on. And it really tells you very much um, sort of the, the how dishonest the Dobbs decision was that reversed Roe v. Wade, this idea of how we're just sending it back to the states. That's not what's going on. This was part of a religious fervor um, that was animating what was going on. And you have Justice Alito really just saying it out loud um, whether you like the idea of the tape recordings being happening in the way they they were done is sort of neither here nor there because you know there was nothing that prevented him from responding in the way that Justice Roberts responded, which was entirely correct. And the tape reveals the profound depths of the stupidity of Samuel Alito. Uh, we're out of time for this discussion. Andrew Weissman, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. Welcome. Coming up, our next guest needs either a very long introduction or no introduction. I'll decide which one during our commercial break. Rachel Maddow joins us next. Wyoming in the 1940s. Wonderful Wyoming, state of promise. Land of far horizons. Horizons. Promise. Also, pigeons. Lots and lots of pigeons. There was a serious infestation of pigeons. That's Roger McDaniel, a Wyoming historian and author. He also served in both houses of the Wyoming State Legislature. And the pigeon infestation he's talking about was at his old workplace at the Wyoming State Capitol. That is the start of season two of Rachel Maddow Presents Ultra, the podcast in which Rachel once again introduces us to a U.S. senator I have never heard of. Lester Hunt is the man who climbed out on the window ledges at the state capitol to drop poison to kill the pigeons. Lester Hunt, when he did this, was the newly elected governor of the state of Wyoming. It gives me pleasure to introduce to you at this time the Honorable Lester Hunt, the governor of Wyoming. He set his sights on the U.S. Senate, and he won that race, too. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Lester C. Hunt, United States Senator from Wyoming. The most popular politician in his state. Lester Hunt, newly elected a U.S. Senator. He heads to Washington to do what he has always done, to advocate for his constituents, for the people of Wyoming, also now to try to do some good for the whole rest of the country through service in the United States Senate. He is as poised as anyone could be for success in that job. But things are about to change for him, radically. What he is about to encounter in Washington will cost him his life. He will not live to see the end of even one term as U.S. Senator. Joining us now is Rachel Maddow. You can get the first episode of Ultra's second season now everywhere you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe to MSNBC Premium on the Apple Podcast app to get every new episode early and ad-free. Rachel, I, I can't take it. Uh, listen, we, we, got, we got 10 minutes. It's just us. Tell me all the okay. rest of it right now. <laughs> like the, I can't wait for the next episode. Just go. So then what happens? It, yeah, it, it, well, I mean, and then there's us at the end of it, like it becomes the America that we know. Um, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Thank you so much for letting me come on your show to talk about it and for listening to it and for liking it. Um, Lester Hunt is, is, I mean, he's not a completely forgotten figure, but the thing, 
things went so badly for him very quickly after he got to Washington that what I was sort of trying to do in episode one is create, I think, the sense of the lost possibility. Like, he really did lose his life to this scandal that I'm, write, that I'm writing about and working on in this podcast. And it's a huge loss for the country because he did have a long, bright future ahead of him if everything else in his life leading up to that moment uh, was anything to go by. And I sort of feel like I've become really good at resurrecting old villains who we had forgotten mm -hmm. about from history. But Lester Hunt is one of the good guys who we need to kind of unearth and remember his legacy to. And the loss of him to something that went really wrong with extremism in American politics uh, is something that we should um, regret and remember and commemorate. Yeah, so he, he's a Democrat getting elected in Republican Ohio, uh, Wyoming, Wyoming. Uh, difficult thing to do, uh, and impressive no matter when you hear that. Uh, you know, he's kind of the John Tester of his time there yes. uh, in, in that situation. Uh, but, but apparently very naive uh, when, when he gets to Washington in such a way, and, and not, I'm speaking beyond what I know. Because uh, all I know is episode one, but clearly he gets eaten up by Washington, and so this is yeah. this is a drama about more than him, though. So there's this. What happens with him, um, and you'll get there very quickly in the next couple of episodes, um, is that he he is confronted in the Senate with the first major thing he does in the Senate. There is another senator who is in the opposite party, who is kind of his opposite number, and this other senator gets involved in a Nazi propaganda campaign, um, a foreign influence operation, which is an absolutely outrageous, like, dirty, false conspiracy theory tale that is designed to hurt the United States. And Lester Hunt realizes what this other senator is doing. He's absolutely repulsed by it. Um, and they come to loggerheads in the Senate over this thing that this other senator is trying to advance. And part of the reason that I wanted to do this story was learning that while that is happening, while they are becoming mortal enemies in the United States Senate, they also live next door to one another. And their backyards back up onto each other's houses. And while they have decided they are out to destroy each other, they can see how the other one of them, how, how each other are living. And that only ratchets up the revulsion that Lester Hunt has for this other senator. And he just decides, you know what, I'm just going to take the political risk. I've got to stand up against a monster like this. And he does. And it's for the good of the country. And it costs him his life. Um, but what he is fighting for and the reason he is fighting against that foreign influence operation in Washington and what, like, the low-down, dirty depths that some people were willing to go for for political gain is an inspiration to me, even though it cost him his life. So the, the first season of Ultra taught us about uh, the pull that fascism had in the United States, the attraction that it had for some people, how far they were willing to go to advance the cause of fascism here. Uh, and yeah. this, is, this takes us, and that's pre-World War II uh, and into World War II, that, that story. And, and this takes us to a period after World War II, where it, it hasn't, you make the point that those people, most of them tended to disappear after Pearl Harbor, uh, but that didn't mean they stopped thinking what they were thinking. And it also didn't mean they went away in politics. I mean, one of the things that you and I talked about a lot with, with Ultra Season 1 was that that became kind of a forgotten story. The Great Sedition Trial, mm -hmm. all the Americans who sort of worked with a Nazi agent, who sided with the Nazis, who wanted the Nazis to win World War II, um, they were defeated um, in the United States one way or another. And that means that we forgot their stories. Um, and it means we forgot their stories pretty quickly. And so when they were all kind of let go and didn't have to, you know, they didn't get prosecuted for it, they weren't successfully prosecuted for it. Or, um, you know, in, in the case of members of Congress, none of them were prosecuted at all. Their story was mostly forgotten, and those of whom, those of them that stayed in public life, kept being the same kind of people they were before. And so, um, 
for example, uh, one of the characters in Ultra Season 2 is a guy who was part of the Silver Shirts and linked to the German-American Bund and was writing for Father Charles Coughlin's publication. Those were all entities that we learned about in Ultra Season 1. In Ultra Season 2, he ends up being the subject of an international years-long manhunt by the United States government as what they, they believe him to be not just an American fascist, but an American fascist and a traitor and possibly a nuclear terrorist. Um, so this stuff gets, just gets worse mm -hmm. when these people get away. And he ends up involved with a Republican senator. Um, in the United, who is a sitting senator in the United States Senate. So um, when you let these folks go away, uh, get away with things, uh, it's important that you at least keep tabs on them to see where else they're going to turn up mm -hmm. because it's never good. So uh, how many episodes, Rachel? Eight. Eight. OK. Uh, and those of us who want, say, 16 or 24, is there any? <laughs> what do we do? Uh, but <clears throat> so you you tell stories in your show that are similar to this. They tend to be in the 20 to 25 minute range, something like that. <clears throat> Each podcast episode is significantly longer than that. What is the difference for you as a storyteller and the way you approach the podcast as opposed to the way you approach the show? Very good question. So the podcast is basically, it's a, it's a little book, right? It's a, it's a, or it's a TV show. Like if you think about it that like mm -hmm. it's, if you put all the, the episode lengths together, it ends up being something that I want to be able to hold your attention for about four or five hours. Um, and so in order to hold your attention for that time, it has to be well told. We use a lot of archival audio, a lot of historical audio, finding the Wisconsin, I mean, sorry, the, the Wyoming audio archives yeah. to get the sound of Lester Hunt's voice was an incredible odyssey and super fun. Um, but the idea is that this is a single story arc that can't be told in the course of a TV show. Mm -hmm. You need to stick with it for an eight episode arc. But by the time you get to the end of it, you should have learned a whole new thing about American history and hopefully be sort of propelled in, along the way by the dramatic interest in it so that it sticks. Um, I want these stories to be memorable. Like, I'm not just interested in these stories because they're not well known. I'm interested in these stories because I think they should be well known. Like, we should all remember Lester Hunt. We should remember that there was an internationally wanted American fascist fugitive who was involved with a Republican senator at the outset of the Cold War. Like, we should understand what happens when the great sedition trial in the United States ends with all of those people getting away and all of those seditionist movements effectively getting away without ever being criminally held, held criminally accountable for what they'd been charged with. Um, I want those stories to be vernacular, to be part of the way that we think about our history as Americans in dealing with really strong anti-democratic challenges, because we have a strong anti-democratic challenge right now. So we should know what's kind of in our armamentarium of options for how to respond to it and what's worked well in the past and what hasn't. Well, and the, the key to this kind of great drama is even if you don't care about democracy, and I don't understand you if you don't, but if you don't care about democracy, this is still great drama with great characters uh, just perfectly told uh, by America's friendliest voice to tell you scary things. Uh, <laughs> the, the good news is these scary things are kind of over, except there are... Uh, big threads of them that are still with us. Now, Rachel, by the way, alternative name uh, for Ultra that you could have considered, it's more letters, but Stuff Lawrence O'Donnell Doesn't Know. That that <laughs> could be <laughs> the, the title. It's harder to squeeze it into the small space. I, I kind of, I mean, America's, what would you say, friendliest voice telling yeah. you the, for telling you scary stories? Yeah. That I'm, I may I may hit you up for the copyright on that. Because yeah, you got I might, it. <laughs> it's I yours. I may want to use that. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Rachel. Can't wait for more episodes. Much appreciated, my friend. I really, really, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Remember, you can listen to the first episode of Ultra's second season everywhere you listen to your podcasts. And coming up, there have been only two presidents in the, hist in the history of the United States who have issued pardons to members of their family. President Joe Biden has promised he will not become the third as a jury deliberates the case against Hunter Biden. That's next with Andrew Weissman.
your son Hunter is on trial, and I know that you cannot speak about an ongoing uh, federal prosecution. But let me ask you, will you accept the jury's outcome, their verdict, no matter what it is? Yes. And have you ruled out a pardon for your son? Yes. On President Bill Clinton's last day in office, he pardoned his younger half-brother, Roger Clinton, who served one year of his federal prison sentence after pleading guilty to cocaine distribution charges. 138 years earlier, President Abraham Lincoln pardoned his wife's sister, a widow of a Confederate soldier. In one of the thousands of pardons issued after the Civil War under the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction. That is the entire history of presidential pardons for family members of the president. The jury completed one hour of deliberation today in the federal case against President Biden's son, Hunter Biden. The jury is considering three federal felony charges against Hunter Biden. Count one, false statement in purchase of a firearm. Count two, false statement related to information required to be kept by federal firearms licensed dealer. Count three, possession of a firearm by a person who is an unlawful user of or addicted to a controlled substance. The Washington Post reports, Biden's lawyers argue that prosecutors have not offered evidence that their client was on drugs when he bought the gun and signed a federal form attesting that he was not using illegal substances or that he took drugs during the 11 days the gun was in his possession. Biden family members, including First Lady Jill Biden, have been in attendance at the trial in support of Hunter Biden. President Biden did not attend or comment on the trial, but he issued this written statement last week. I am the president, but I'm also a dad. Jill and I love our son, and we are so proud of the man he is today. Hunter's resilience in the face of adversity and the strength he has brought to his recovery are inspiring to us. A lot of families have loved ones who have overcome addiction and know what we mean. As the president, I don't and won't comment on pending federal cases, but as a dad, I have boundless love for my son, confidence in him, and respect for his strength. Our family has been through a lot together, and Jill and I are going to continue to be there for Hunter and our family with our love and support. After this break, Andrew Weissman will give us his evaluation of the evidence in the Hunter Biden case. That's next. As Hunter Biden waits for the jury's verdict in the federal criminal case against him, we're joined by former federal prosecutor Andrew Weissman to evaluate the evidence. Andrew, what do you think the jury is focusing on in this case at this point in their deliberations? Well, um, before I get to that, I just want to point out that we do, compared to the opening where we talked about Justice Alito and the concern about the rule of law in this country, this is an example, as was the New York criminal trial of the rule of law working, um, where you see the courts functioning, even when you're dealing with a former president, or in this case, the son of the current president. Um, I think they're focusing on intent. Um, you know, this the proof here is very strong um, that there was possession of the gun. Uh, there's very strong evidence of um, the addiction that Hunter Biden um, had. And the issue is, was he sort of aware during the relevant time periods uh, of when he signed the form that said that essentially he was not an addict? Um, did he believe that he at that point was an addict? And then also during the time that he possessed the gun for about that two week period, did he also believe that he was an addict? Um, in other words, there's an intent requirement you know, making a mistake is not for the criminal law, that's for civil law, but this is a criminal case. So I think they're going to be focused on that. There obviously is sufficient proof that the jury wants to find it. It is a very strong case. Um, but Abby Lowell is an extremely good defense lawyer. And, you know, we'll see whether he pulls a rabbit out of a hat. But I do think the big picture for the public is less sort of what happens in this case. And the fact that you have a president of the United States living the rule of law in this country, and you have the rule of law working even for the president's son. Andrew Weissman, thank you very much. You're welcome. That is tonight's last word.